We know that's possible because of a momentous dichotomy that follows directly from the rejection of the supernatural. Namely, every transformation of physical systems that is not forbidden by laws of physics is achievable given the right knowledge. And hence, the rational attitude to the future is what I call optimism, the principle of optimism, namely that all evils are caused by lack of knowledge. That isn't a prophecy of success. It's an explanation for failure. If we fail at anything that's physically possible, it's because of some knowledge that we fail to create. The way I, I think of knowledge is uh, broader than the usual use of those terms, and yet paradoxically closer to the common sense use of the term, because uh, philosophers have almost defined it out of existence. Mm. Uh, knowledge is um, a kind of information. That's the, the uh, simple thing. It's, it's something which could have been otherwise and is one particular way. And the particular way it is is uh, that it says something true and useful about the world. Now, knowledge is in a sense an abstract thing because it, it, it's independent of its physical instantiation. I can speak words which, uh, in, which uh, embody some knowledge. I can write them down. They can um, uh, exist as uh, movements of electrons in a computer and so on, thousands of different ways. Uh, so they're not, knowledge isn't dependent on any particular instantiation. On the other hand, it does have the property that when it is instantiated, it tends to remain so. So the difference between, let's say, a piece of uh, speculation by a scientist which he writes down and then that's, that turns out to be a genuine piece of knowledge, that will be the piece of paper that he does not throw in the waste paper basket. Mm. And that's the piece that will be published and that's the piece will be, which, which will be studied by other scientists and so on. So it is a piece of information that has the property of keeping itself physically instantiated, causing itself to be physically instantiated once it already is. Once you think of knowledge that way, you realize that, for example, the pattern of base pairs in, in the DNA of a gene also constitute knowledge. Mm. And uh, that, in turn, connects with Karl Popper's concept of knowledge, which is knowledge that doesn't have to have a knowing subject. It can exist in books, abstractly, or it can exist in the mind, or people can have knowledge that they don't even know they have. The eye only detects light, which we don't perceive. Brains only detect nerve impulses. And they don't perceive even those as what they really are, namely electrical crackles. So we perceive nothing as what it really is. Our connection to reality is never just perception. It's always, as Karl Popper put it, theory-laden. Scientific knowledge isn't derived from anything. It's, like all knowledge, it's conjectural, guesswork. Tested by observation, not derived from it. I think that all progress, uh, historically and today, comes from the quest for good explanations. That is, explanations that are hard to vary without, uh, while still... Um, accounting for what they purport to account for. This principle, one of the reasons I like this principle, is that not only does it explain um, uh, what the criterion for success is in science, where it leads to things like the principle of testability of theories, because a test uh, constrains the explanation so that it's hard to vary, but it also applies outside physics uh, in, in philosophy, in epistemology, in metaphysics, and so on. The same thing applies, and even beyond that, in political philosophy, moral philosophy, and aesthetics, the same principle applies everywhere and draws a distinction between ideas that have a chance of making progress and ideas that have no chance of making progress. <laughs>